You're good. Oh, it's very bright. Go for it. All right. Hi, guys. I'm Tammy. I don't know how many of you know me, um, but uh, I am supposedly the newsletter ninja. Um, I wrote a book you probably have heard about. Um, I teach some courses, uh, and I really, really love to talk about newsletters. So, um, because we don't have a ton of time today, I wanted to keep the topic pretty tight, as opposed to here's everything you need to know about newsletters, here's one very specific thing you might want to do. Let me preface this by saying if you're the sort of person who thinks that you should only build your list organically, that you should never offer a bribe or do list building exercise, more power to you if it's working. I never tell people who are making a lot of money that they're doing something wrong. So there's that. But if you're like the rest of us, um, I personally am of the opinion that I want all the subscribers and then I will work out whether or not they should stay. Which brings us to the topic of you and your reader who are waking up married, okay? <laughs> so you guys haven't met before. Um, they maybe caught your eye across a crowded room, crowded casino, um, like the look of your reader magnet, maybe? And um, that's awesome. So, we just woke up in bed with this reader. Please don't actually sleep with your readers. <laughs> I am not condoning that. What just happened, right? Okay, here's what happened. You were dancing on a table, right? And that's what happened. You did maybe some advertising. You did some Facebook advertising. You did, um, you can actually do BookBub advertising that you can drive to a reader magnet. You cannot require an email address to do that. So that would be a situation where you'd want a reader magnet with an absolutely crazy good call to action at the back that would get them to go sign up for your mailing list. But BookBub, BookBub will let you run an ad to a landing page on your own site that has a free book. Um, so maybe you did some advertising, whoops, I went too. Maybe you did a book sweeps giveaway, which you should. Um, I don't know if Ryan's here, but Ryan is actually uh, implementing a whole brand new version of book sweeps. It's super, super cool. I had a chance to preview it. Um, you are all gonna love it, so if you have not been paying attention to book sweeps, you should start. And if you have been paying attention, start paying even more attention, because that'll roll out really soon. Maybe you did a book funnel bundle, which you also should be doing. Um, book funnel, unlike some of the other ways that you get your books out there, like um, uh, Storyworks, or I don't think it's called Insta Freebie anymore, right? Those are a little bit more reader facing. Those are a thing where someone can kind of browse and total strangers can come and look at your reader magnet. You may get more freebie seekers. Book funnel, of course, is totally author facing. And I really like that because nobody winds up on my book funnel landing page unless I intended for them to do so. That gives you a little bit more control. Or maybe. You did some cross-promotion or newsletter swaps. That is also a really great thing to do. I have actually kind of listed these in order from like broadest to probably best subscribers for you. The reason being that the more targeted and the more personal the recommendation, the better the um, quality of the subscriber right from the get-go. But every one of these people, even if they've never heard your name and they saw your reader magnet in a Facebook ad, they are all people that you can turn into super fans if you onboard them the right way, which is what we'll talk about in a little bit. So what are we gonna do now, right? We wake up, we look over there, oh man, who are you? Um, and that's okay, that's fine, this is a predicament, what are we gonna do? The answer is that we have to make a choice. You're gonna decide, are you gonna do the sensible thing, which of course is to run screaming immediately and get an annulment right away, quick as you can. Um, if you choose to do that, of course, the analogy of the enrollment is um, you're going to want to have in every onboarding email, and I do mean every onboarding email, you want to have a really big unsubscribe button for people, okay? So um, somebody gets your reader magnet, they start getting your onboarding emails, your welcome emails, whatever it is that you're sending them, and the first thing you're going to want to say to those people is, hey, if you just wanted to pick up a free book or whatever it is you offered them, totally cool, no harm, no foul, click this button to unsubscribe. Here's my ninja tip for 20 books only. I actually create an unsubscribe button that leads to a page on my website that says thank you for unsubscribing and it unsubscribes them automatically. But I do not use the created link at the bottom if I can help it because that gives them the opportunity to mark you as spam or promotions, which you are not. If they entered a promotion and they downloaded your reader magnet, think it's wicked uncool for them to call you spam, I just straight up make them an un unsubscribe button and unsubscribe them myself. Mainly because if you do a really big cross promotion, for example, um, I did a cross promotion and got probably about 11,000 names. 
Um, when you import 11,000 names into ActiveCampaign and 4,000 of them unsubscribe, which is fine, I'm happy to have them unsubscribe, you do tend to get some emails from ActiveCampaign <laughs> that say, what are you doing over there? So big unsubscribe button in every single onboarding email. Your other option, though, is maybe we should give this thing a shot. You're kind of cute. I mean, obviously, you're compatible in some way. Maybe we should give this a try. What you're going to do with the people that might be likely to stick around on that list is you're going to be super direct with them. Here's who I am. Here's how you got here. Always a good idea to say, here's how you got here in your welcome emails. Um, on the off chance that they look at it later and they have forgotten that they did a big thing, or if you do, for example, a book sweeps um, giveaway, you actually receive those names quite a bit later than the actual promotion that they were in, so it's good to remind them, you did a promotion on such and such a date, and this is why I'm emailing you. You're gonna wanna try to get to know each other, and we'll actually talk about that a lot in just a few minutes, specific ways to get to know each other. And you're gonna wanna make promises that you can keep. So from the beginning, you need to tell people what you're gonna do with them and how the newsletter's gonna work. It's actually super, super important because it gives them an expectation that they can see you fulfill. And what I mean by that is, if you say to them, I'm gonna email you once a month, and then they start getting emails every four days, then they're gonna unsubscribe, as well they should. Because the people who saw I'm gonna email you every month and stayed are not people who probably want an email every four days, okay? So you tell them what it is that you're gonna do. In this newsletter, you're gonna hear from me once a month. I do some cool giveaways. I often have good swag. Um, I recommend a lot of other authors. You're totally gonna to love this. Um, cover reveals, depending on your genre. You guys all know what your newsletter people like. If you don't, we'll talk about that too. So, you're gonna introduce yourself. This is how the onboarding sequence begins. Who are you? What do you write? Uh, when did you start writing? Where are you from? Um, why do you write the things you write? That's always really interesting. One thing that I tell people a lot in class, and they almost always push back on me, is give these people a little bit of a personal glimpse at you. Now, when I say personal, I think that they mean like, I don't know, send them nudes, but I don't mean that, actually. Because anything can be personal, okay? I'm gonna actually do a call out. She's not here, but um, one person who took my class, Lucy Score, if you write romance, you know who Lucy is. Um, Lucy has an amazing reader group on Facebook. She does not um, post pictures of her family. Um, in fact, her husband is this enigma and they just call him Mr. Lucy. She doesn't talk about where she lives. She's actually a pretty private person. But if you go into her group, what you'll see is that everybody there talks a lot about tacos because Lucy really loves tacos. And this is a thing that she hits over and over and over again. So that's kind of her thing. People feel like they know a thing about her. Now we all like tacos. So it's not like it's you know super personal but it gives people some way to connect with you. With my steamy romance pen name, her thing is Jason Momoa. More actually than my thing is Jason Momoa. It's kind of gotten out of control over there. And my reader group is just like full of pictures of Jason Momoa. So it gives people something to kind of hang their hat on, a way in which they can say, oh, she's like this. This is a way that um, he's like me. He likes the same stuff that I like. Um, oh, I just already told you all that stuff. So you can tell them, uh, I live in the country, I live in the big city, you can tell them specifically. I live in, you know, Boston, you can tell them whatever. Pets are a big hit. Um, the most, second most replied email in my onboarding sequence has a link to um, a page on my website that talks about my rescue cat, who is ridiculous and has like too many paws and her eyes are always crossed and she's ridiculous. And um, people always reply to that story because it's very heartwarming. Um, like I said, what you write, why you write it, how long you've written it. If you write fantasy, of course, you're gonna tell your people how much you love Tolkien and you read that as a child, and they're gonna reply to you and say, me too, which is not very surprising. So what other authors you like, what other books you like. Directors, movies, move into other media. There's no reason not to do this. In your newsletter, in advertising, in all kinds of things that you do that are in front of readers. Talk about other media as well, because we're not just reading books. And people who read books do still consume other media. So if your books are a lot like Supernatural, is Laura here, Laura Martone? If your books are a lot like Supernatural or like Firefly or something, tell people that. That gives them, again, something to hang their hat on. Oh, I would like to read a book that's like that because that's a TV series that I really like or that's a movie I really enjoy. Most important, you need to be yourself. That's uh, what you're best at, I'm, I'm assuming. And it is actually really hard to fake it. I'm not gonna say that you can't fake it because that's actually not true. 
But generally speaking, I'm going to say that it is really hard in an ongoing newsletter situation to continually present yourself as somebody that you are not. I do know a few authors that can do it. They're exceptional. I could not do it. I could not write, for example, science fiction. Well, first of all, I couldn't write science fiction. But if I did, I'd have a really hard time presenting myself as somebody who was super, super into that because I don't have the grounding for it. I don't have um, the reading experience. I haven't seen the movies, all of that kind of thing. So be yourself. It's the easiest thing to do, and then you don't have to remember like who it was that you said you were going to be. Um, Keep in mind what it is that you tempted them on board with. So obviously you're going to want your reader magnet, whatever it is, to be tightly aligned with whatever else it is that you write, of course. So if you write romance, probably your onboarding isn't going to talk about maybe science fiction. Your onboarding isn't going to talk about something that doesn't dovetail with those particular tropes and expectations that people have from the genre you write in and the freebie that you offered them. However, down the road with your newsletter, Definitely branch out. There's someone out there who is like you that reads romance but is also super, super into superheroes. You know what I mean? And those people will cleave to you even more tightly when you've kind of exposed that part of yourself. That sounded a little dirtier than I meant it to be. <laughs> but that's fine. Um, <laughs> so, and the actual tones of the emails themselves, make sure that those dovetail really well with what it is that they expect from you also. Um, a post-apocalyptic author is going to onboard very differently from a steamy romance author, one hopes. Um, and you're going to talk about different things. You love different things, right? You're going to speak in different ways. If you write military sci-fi, maybe you can drop the F-bomb. If you write sweet romance, I don't recommend it. And, you know, just that sort of thing. Every genre has its expectations, and the readers are going to expect that not just from your books, but also from the persona that you present to them as you're getting to know each other. Um, yeah, okay, so don't fake it, got that. Now, after we're done introducing ourselves, we need to get to know them a little bit, right? Um, now, of course, hopefully there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. It's very hard to know thousands and thousands of people. I can't even look at this like 800 of you. But you can ask them questions and get them to answer, and you can learn some general trends about people. And then one thing that actually is kind of cool is there will always be people that stand out. So there are actually a few people who get my newsletter who reply pretty frequently, who at this point I kind of feel like I know. And that's, that's actually a pretty cool thing to have happen, particularly when they come back after something new comes out and they're like, this is perfect, this is the best book you've ever written. That's kind of great. Um, so you're going to ask them questions like, who are they? Are they married? Do they have kids? Do they have pets? Where do they live? What kind of books do they like? What kind of movies do they like? There will be different people who will be willing to answer different things um, in much the same way that people are more or less comfortable being personal in revealing themselves in their newsletter, subscribers will be more or less comfortable revealing themselves back to you. Um, again, if you say anything about your pets, everybody will reply with a picture of their pet. I don't know why, but they totally do, and I'm not even kidding. Um, so those are the questions that um, are for them, to get them, like, here's how I want to get to know you, let me ask you this stuff about you. Then there are questions you ask that are a little bit more mercenary. Those are questions for you. What store do you buy from, right? Um, are you a buyer? Do you buy books or are you in Kindle Unlimited? Those are not obviously mutually exclusive, as we know, but it is a good thing to know. Um, you can do polls with them. Uh, ask them about character names. Ask them their other favorite authors. Ask them what tropes they like. Um, what do they want to see in your newsletter? What do they like when you do in your newsletter? All of this information is stuff that you can use. You can track this data and do things a little bit differently in your writing, in your newsletter, in your career as a whole based on what this tribe of readers you're building is telling you that they want from you. And ultimately, that's really important. The best way that you're going to do this is to ask good questions. That's really hard for some people, right? Let me tell you, there's a whole chapter, or not a whole chapter, but the bulk of a chapter in Newsletter Ninja, which if you haven't read it, I'm just going to pimp it out and say you totally should. Um, there's a whole section in there about what makes a good question, but in general, it's a question that people want to answer, right? So if I ask you, what's your favorite soda, we are going to have a really boring conversation, right? 
But um, the example I use in the book is if I ask you who's the best golden girl, we are going to have a hell of a conversation because it's Dorothy and I'll fight you and everybody has an opinion. Like nobody goes, eh, whatever, golden girls. Or if they do, they feel really strongly about something else. Um, romance readers feel really strongly about which of the superhero Chris's is the most handsome. Is it Hemsworth? Is it Pratt? Is it Evans? I almost forgot his name. That'd be terrible. Um, and they all feel very strongly about it. No one's going to say, eh, whatever, I don't have an opinion. So, see, everyone's having opinions right now. <laughs> In real time, having active opinions. And it's Hemsworth. Right, guys? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the others, but I'm here to tell you I've asked this question, and it's Hemsworth. Boy, is it Hemsworth. Um, so... Then we're going to try to find out, are you compatible? If you're going to keep doing this thing, this crazy thing, we woke up married, are we going to stay married? That's a crazy thing to do. Unless, of course, you're a romance writer and you read a lot of rom-coms, then it makes perfect sense, right? But <laughs> unless you're Jamie Albright, it makes perfect sense. Um, what you're going to want to know about these people to find out if they're the sort of people that you want on your list, if you are in that way compatible. Do they open, right? So as they're going through the onboarding, you're watching the data. How many people opened? How many people didn't open? Do they click on things? Because you will be offering them things to click on as they go through. Um, I should say don't rely too heavily on do they click, only because some people, particularly over a certain age, have been taught not to ever click anything, right? Grandma, if you click on another link in another email that you get, I'm not going to fix your computer anymore. So don't worry about clicking so much, but it is a good metric to keep track of. And certainly knowing who does is useful, even if you can't be 100% confident that somebody who doesn't is any kind of problem. What are they clicking? Do they only click when you have something free to offer them? Hey, I wrote you a new story. Or hey, this book happens to be free today on the store. Do they only click when you give away something else, like a bouncy box? Except I don't think we have bouncy boxes anymore. Um, or a gift card, or something like that. Do they only click on KU Books? That's something that's very interesting to note. And if your provider, um, I'm an active campaign and they do, has the um, ability to do this, you can tag them. If they click on books that you've said in are in Kindle Unlimited, this is free in Kindle Unlimited, you can tag them as someone who clicks on KU. Useful information to have and to be able to parse them out later on. Um, do they only click on other authors? That's kind of a nightmare. But again, maybe they already have everything you wrote. If they're fans and they love you, they may already have what you've got. So don't put too much credence in that. But if you were to notice it, not just in onboarding, but across the entirety of newsletters that you're sending them, you might want to think, hmm, I wonder why they're doing that. Do they click on recommendations? And this is actually a big one for me. The reason being that I very um, genuinely, because I read romance and I love other romance authors, I do also frequently recommend books that I'd really like to, for Amazon to make a connection between my book and their book. Someone's got a brand new book and it's like 70 in the store. I might really want someone to click on that book so that the also bots start to reflect that people who like me like that person and vice versa. It's not something that's going to skyrocket your career, but every incremental little step that you use to teach Amazon what sort of book you're writing is super helpful. So I do a lot of recommendations, and I really do want people to click on those. Do they seem to want the same things that you want? So if you send out a certain type of newsletter asking a certain type of question, do you get a giant mass of unsubscribes? Maybe you need to th rethink who your, your tribe is. If you send out a certain kind of newsletter, do you get replies that are like, that was a strange question, or I, I, I I don't even know what you're talking about, or why are you asking that, or that's not what I joined this list for, which I hate hearing. Um, just something to think about as well. How are they reacting to what you're doing? How are they liking what you're doing? And you want to track all of this data, okay? which can be a huge pain. Get yourself an assistant if you have to. You want to track behind the scenes if your if you're, um, service will allow you to tag and segment based on what people do, whether they open, whether they click, whether they reply to something. You may also have to do it manually. You may have to get yourself a little spreadsheet and make a note of everyone who replied to you, for example, and then how often they reply or whatever. But you want to track all of your information. I'm, I'm, I'm firm on this because it helps you to make list building decisions. So if I do a book sweeps promo in a certain subgenre, and all of the subscribers that I get from that end up not being very good subscribers, that is probably not a book sweeps problem, because Ryan Z is pretty awesome. I probably put it in the wrong subgenre, or ran it at the wrong time, or it just wasn't, it's a book that didn't hit the way that it should have. I missed some genre conventions or some tropes. 
It's definitely something that you should keep your eye on, and it helps you to refine your onboarding. If there's a single email in your onboarding that like 60% of people unsubscribe at, you're gonna revisit that email and figure out what you're doing or what you didn't do that made people check out at that process. And you can't make any of those choices if you don't have the data. So we've got them go, we've gone through their onboarding. We had a chance to look at what they're doing. We looked at how they're opening. We looked at how they're clicking. We've got some sense of if we're compatible. What if we're not? What if the, you really should have just got the annulment on day one because they're kind of a douche? <laughs> we're gonna break up and that's fine. I actually have my own onboarding is set and it's just automated. I don't even have to think about it. The last thing that happens once someone's gone through my onboarding, which is four, four or five emails, I actually don't remember. At the very end, the system asks, have they opened any of these emails? And if they haven't, they're gone, obviously. Have they clicked on anything? It asks a bunch of different questions and there are people who just get shunted off and they just go, which is totally, totally fine. Um, so what you're gonna wanna look at as you go through those onboarding stats is who opened every email, who opened you know, every second or third email, who, this is not for onboarding, but this is for like later on with your actual newsletter. Have you found a group of people who used to open and they don't anymore? That's a group that you're definitely gonna wanna keep an eye on. Um, probably means that they're not seeing your emails. That's a deliverability problem. That's a little outside the scope of today, but you can definitely talk to me about it. Um, and I have my email address at the end, so you can, you can email me too. Who's never opened anything? Obviously we just dump them, no problem. And then we give them a last chance. We do this for a couple of different reasons, and honestly the most important reason that we give them a last chance is that there is a non-zero number of people who do open your emails and you can't see it. And that's really important. A lot of authors come to me and they say, yeah, I just kick off everybody who doesn't open. And I'm like, but you don't know that they didn't really open. Um, Opens register generally based on an image loading. So what happens is your, servers, your service sends out the email and there's a, a pixel, there's actually a tiny invisible pixel in that email and as the email loads, it sends the information back to MailChimp or whoever, they open this email. This image was shown to someone, so that means the email was opened. Well, that doesn't work if they read in the preview pane, they don't load images, which is actually the default on a lot of mobile devices. Um, they opened it just saw what it was about and said, oh, I've already seen this and deleted it before the page finished loading. There's actually a bunch of reasons that a, that a non-open might register, but the person actually did open. So when I send a last chance email, hey, it seems like you haven't been opening for a while and I only wanna send emails to people who want them. We're always trying to make this about them, right? I'm not gonna say, hey, I noticed you haven't opened and I don't wanna pay active campaign for you, so you're out. I noticed that you haven't been opening, actually what I usually say is the robots say, because it's nice to blame the technology, that you haven't been opening your emails, and I only wanna send emails to people who want to receive them, so I'm gonna go ahead and unsubscribe everybody. If you're getting this email, and you are opening my emails, click here. And if they click, Active Campaign knows that they clicked. They can miss an open, they don't generally miss a click, and that way they'll be registered. For me, it tags them behind the scenes as a non-open. I mean, as someone whose opens don't register, you might instead say hit reply and let me know, and that's someone that you can go in and note you know, manually is someone that you don't wanna throw off. Because two things will come from that. The first is that the next time you send this email, hey, I noticed you haven't been opening, you're gonna exclude those people. They don't wanna hear from you every three or six months saying, do you still like me? Because they won't, and that is perfectly understandable. So the last chance can go one of two ways. That last chance email, I don't just say, hey, are you out there, are you paying attention? What I do is I either give them something super good, right? So I used to do bouncy boxes, but I do think, I think the bouncy box giveaways on Amazon have gone the way of the dodo bird, if I'm not mistaken. Right, so what I used to do was, for example, um, in, I have a steamy romance pending who writes billionaire nonsense, and I say that lovingly because I love my billionaire nonsense, but that's what it is, and she would give away like a box set movie tie-in version of Fifty Shades of Grey. That's a good present. They probably don't have it. It's not one of my books. You can't really give away your own books because people might already have them. That's not a good way to judge. So I would give away like a box set of something really cool in a bouncy box, and everybody who clicks I know is at least still active out there. I do also tag them that they almost got booted but they stayed for the freebie because I wanna know that down the road should it come up again. But, so you can offer them something super, super awesome. Hey, I'm cleaning out the list, I just wanna make sure you're still here and I'm doing this really cool giveaway. Or you can say to heck with those so-and-sos, I cheap 
bastards. I don't like them. And you can just throw them out. That's totally fine as well. You can just say, I'm here to see if you're actually paying attention. And if you don't want to be on this list anymore, you'll be unsubscribed in a week. Or you can click here to unsubscribe right now. And again, I always give them a great big button because I, I don't want Active Campaign to send me a little nasty gram. I will take an aside to say it is worth cultivating a really above board and ethically sourced list of people. It's worth making sure that you don't have a lot of unsubscribes, that you don't have a lot of people who report you as spam. Because when I did get the nasty gram from Active Campaign that said, why did 4,000 people just unsubscribe from your list? Um, I was in line at a, at a music festival on my phone. Like there was not a lot, there wasn't much I could do there. But the email said, we took a look at your account and we noticed that it's essentially what they said was very above board. We noticed you have really high open rates. We noticed that your unsubscribes aren't high. So we were wondering what you might have done that's making this happen. And then I was able to say to them, I did this kind of giveaway. Here's the website where that happened. And I knew that a lot of them wouldn't be great subscribers. And if you look at the first email, you'll see that it invites them to unsubscribe. And they were very nice and they did not boot me, which is lovely, but I then switched to making it so that I just used the big button that unsubscribes them on my end rather than using the automated one. And I strongly recommend it. And then the last thing you're gonna do, is you're gonna give them a way to keep in touch. So this is like your ex stalking you on Facebook or whatever. You're going to say, sorry to see you go, um, but if you wanna know when I have a new book, because that, is actually something you might want to keep them on the string for, even if they're not interested in all the details of your life or what your pets are like or where you went on vacation, they might want to know when your next book is out. What I say is, if you want to know when I have a new book out, follow me on BookBub or follow me on Amazon, and I include those links. I actually don't do a lot to drive BookBub followers and Amazon followers, because uh, I'm the newsletter ninja and I want their emails for myself. Um, but if they're leaving anyway, I'm perfectly happy to have them follow me on somebody else's platform. I can't see them, at least on BookBub you can count them, so thanks BookBub for that. Um, you can't even count them on Amazon. But I can't reach out to them directly in the way that I would if they were on newsletters, so I don't tend to drive traffic to that. But on the way out, absolutely. Give them another reason, give them another way to see what it is that you're up to so that you can still continue to sell them books if that is what they want. Um, okay, and so, Amicable divorce. This is a thing that I actually had. People think it's a, it's a myth, but it can happen. You're going to want to automate purging. So like I said, at the very end of my onboarding sequence, it just automatically sends those people who haven't opened the like, hey, it looks like you haven't been opening email, and then they either click or they don't, and then they're unsubscribed or they're not. And I never touch that. I never see it. I don't look at it. I occasionally look at the stats in general just to see how things are going. But the thing about automating a purge, whether it's during an onboarding or whether it's been six months and you've decided to just kind of, you know, see who's still active and, and reduce your list a little bit, the thing about automatically purging is that, first of all, it's easier because you just have to set it up once and then I just take the people that I'm targeting and move them into that sequence. But it also hurts less <laughs> because honestly, when you've done all this list building and you've, you, your list is up to like, you know, what, I don't know, 7,000, and then you're like, oh, it turns out only like 4,000 of these people are opening. That's kind of like, ouch, right? And you don't actually want to hit the button to unsubscribe 3,000 people. <laughs> it kind of hurts. But you also need to get over it because they're not helping you. They're not doing anything to help you. And in fact, if you've read Ninja, you've seen, they're hurting you. So it's not just that they're not opening, it's that they're not opening signals to their email providers, to Gmail, to Hotmail, to whoever, that your emails are not something that people want. They're not something that people are interested in, they don't open them, they delete them without even looking at them. And that affects not just what happens with that subscriber, but what they do with all of your subscribers. Your reputation is collective, and each one of those subscribers affects your reputation. So just get rid of them. Don't think about it. Don't, don't think about how much money you spent to get them on the list, which can be very depressing. Don't think about how if they just would listen to you, they'd know how totally awesome you are because they don't care and just get rid of them. Don't watch it happen. <laughs> like I said, they just go through an automated thing. Every six months, I take the people who haven't opened the last 10 emails and I say, put them through this automation and then I never look at it again. And my list number goes down and I try not to look at it and it's all good. Just don't watch it happen. Then you're gonna move on, right? Start dating again, I guess. Don't get married in Vegas again because that didn't work out last time. But what you're gonna wanna do is go through your automation real quick, check and make sure they're still doing all of the things that you want it to do. 
um, make sure that uh, the sequence is working out the way that it should, that everything's in it order. Check and make sure if there's something new. You have a new book, you have a new series, that's not part of your onboarding sequence because you built it a year ago. Maybe you need to add another email or add a book to one of your emails. Just go through, check your automation, make sure everything is how you want it to be. Reevaluate your list size. Hey, how, how big is this now? <laughs> like, oh, I did the thing and now I don't have 12,000 people, I have 8,000 people. And you can either plan some new list building, it's time to sign up for book sweeps, it's time to set up a book funnel bundle and get all my friends to, to join, or better than your friends, people you don't know yet, because they've got readers you haven't seen, or downgrade your service. I mean, honestly, if you're like, oh, I've got 7,000 and I'm fine with that, but I'm paying for 12, go ahead and downgrade your service, stick with seven for a while. 7,000 engaged subscribers is a million times better for you than 12,000 people when 50% of them don't open your emails. I think that math works. We're just gonna say that math works. Um, and so downgrade your service if you need to, and then maybe in six months you wanna do another book sweeps. Um, some of the services are cheap, some of them are expensive, but over at Active Campaign, if I downgrade, I'm probably sort of saving like 70 bucks a month, so it matters a lot. And that's it. That's all I had to say about that. That's thank you. Um, that's my website, obviously. You can find this slide deck there at the slash 20 books 2019 on that website. And you can email me there, Tammy at newsletterninja.net. That's pretty easy to remember. Um, the thing about um, emailing me is that, oh, there's my ninja guy. Um, the thing about emailing me is that uh, I'm not always great about checking that email because I am trying to write. So don't be upset if it takes a week for me to get back to you, but I do answer all the emails. So if you've got a question, just a quick question. I don't wanna like, you know, spend 40 years talking you through your newsletter. But if you're like, hey, I know I wanna know if I should do this or that. I'm having this problem with my newsletter. What do you think is the solution? Shoot me an email and I'll just answer you. I love having opinions about newsletters. It's like my favorite thing to do. And that's it. We have time for questions, right? Awesome. Bring them on. <laughs> it's my voice. Hi. Um, if, I've, if you've got a pretty sizable newsletter, but you've allowed it to go fallow because you've been sort of lazy um, or busy, um, <laughs> how, how long would you, would you kind of um, like dump it and start anew? Or would you, how, how long, maybe it's been a year? What Since I would they got do, an email. <laughs> <laughs> what you're going to do, first of all, is you're going to show up and do the big mea culpa. Like, hey, guys, it's me. Yeah. <gasps> Sorry. I know you haven't heard from me in a while. Let me preface this by saying you're going to get a bunch of unsubscribes when mm -hmm. you do this. But there's, again, a non-zero number of people who are still there that are going to be like, oh, I haven't heard from her in a while. And I really liked her books. And if you, like, release three in the meanwhile, they might go buy them, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so you're going to say, hey, guys, it's me. Super sorry. <laughs> um, and just... What I would probably recommend is doing sort of a very small abbreviated onboarding style mm -hmm. series of emails just to remind people who you are, particularly if it's been a year um, and particularly if you're in a genre with a lot of churn. If you're in romance and it's been a year, they don't even they don't remember care. who you yeah. are. <laughs> they have no idea who you are. Um, so go ahead and just do a quick abbreviated sort of here's who I am, here's what I write. Remember, this is the book that people seem to like the most. Mm -hmm. Point them to your bestseller. That's probably the one they saw. And from now on, I'm going to make sure to keep in better touch with you and email you every month or whatever. And then you have to do it because there is a limit to the number of mea culpas that you can gotcha. give to the list, you know? Awesome. Thank you so but much. But they're not lost to you, so okay. don't just throw them away. All right, awesome. Hey, Krishan. Hey, you're so sparkly. <laughs> I know, I sparkle. That's Krishan lovely. loaned me my shrug for today so I could sparkle. But she brought her own sparkle herself. <laughs> I have a question about, let's say you're a multi-genre writer who writes a lot of genres and you have one massive mailing list and you don't think you're, you think your opens are not to what they should be, mainly because you do a lot of shit. <laughs> Who would do that? <laughs> and so, um, is it better to actually segment those and then break them up and do several different emails for each one or just do the sections like a newspaper? 
I am a big fan of segmenting and dividing as much as you possibly can, only because my cardinal rule kind of is I don't ever want to send anybody an email that they might not have wanted. Yeah. Um, again, it only hurts you if people don't open them or don't like them. Um, and a, if you send people enough emails that they're not interested in, they'll say, this, I guess, is nothing I like anymore. I'm going to unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. um, I read science fiction, and I actually don't care about her, my little pony fan fiction, so I'm going to just unsubscribe. Hey, now. And so you do. <laughs> Sorry, I love your My Little Pony fan fiction, but I'm just saying some people might not. Um, the one warning I would give is yep. try to do any segmenting that you're going to do on the down low, by which I mean don't ask them to self-segment because they're just going to F it up. They always do. Mm -hmm. Readers are the worst. If you say, do you want to, hi, readers, if you're watching, <laughs> I love you. If you but say to do them, <laughs> check off the boxes for the things you might want to know about. They either, they either they don't do it or they check them all, and they just ruin everything anyway. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do instead, for example, mm -hmm. um, this is actually a great a, a real-life example. When I used to do the emails for Sterling and Stone, mm -hmm. who do what you do and write everywhere, which is, right. you know, not maybe what you should do. Um, but if you're going to do it, you got to divide. Yeah. Um, they had this uh, kind of funny vampire, like, horror thing yeah. called Fat Vampire. Um, I sent out a series of emails that recommended the Tome of Bill series by Rick Gualtieri, mm -hmm. which is very similar in tone and has a lot in common with that. Everybody who clicked on that got targeted as somebody who probably would like Fat Vampire. And then we didn't send it to the rest of the people because they were there for science fiction or whatever the heck else they were writing. So see if you can kind of trick them into clicking on something that will let you know what they're interested in without outright asking them because they really do just click every box because they have FOMO and they don't want to like miss anything. You might, they might love your next My Little Pony fanfic, except they're not going to, right. no matter what they think. So just try to, try, to, try to get them to do it without telling them that that's what you're doing. Will do. Thank you so much, Tim. You're welcome. Hey, Kevin. Hi. Um, so I have uh, MailerLite for my email list, mm -hmm. which does not have a lot of the more advanced functions about tagging and stuff like that. Right. I've cons been considering up uh, upgrading to a different service that did allow tagging. What's your feeling on the value of uh, that sort of tagging Personally, functionality? Oh. oh. OK, so I was asking about, uh, I have MailerLite. I'm looking at potentially moving to something that has more tagging capability. And I'm wondering about the value of having tagging or not, you know, some of the special features that some of the more expensive uh, email lists offer. My sense is that if you're feeling that you might need it, you probably do. Um, I think that if you're a single genre writer and you only kind of write sort of the same thing over and over, which I am not criticizing, good for you, that's the smart thing to do, um, and you're always going to be emailing to the exact same sort of person and you don't really have to tag them in that way, then totally stick with MailerLite, which is awesome, or Mailer, MailChimp, which is not as awesome. Guys, probably you should move to MailerLite. I um, hope we don't have any MailChimp representatives here today, sorry. Um, but if you're feeling like, I wish I had more information, I wish I could parse out some of this information, or I wish that I could divide them in ways that didn't require me going in and looking at a bunch of data that takes too long, then it may be time to upgrade. Um, if you're gonna upgrade, uh, I love Active Campaign. obviously that's what I do, People speak very highly of ConvertKit as well, which I have actually not tried yet. Um, and Drip is amazing, but it's also terrifying. I opened it, I looked at the dashboard, and I just ran away. And I'm good at this. <laughs> like, I'm really good at this. Um, but if you really want to get crazy and granular, Drip is really awesome, too. And if you do want to use ActiveCampaign, hit me up, because I got an affiliate link. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Tammy. Hi. Uh, um, so I got a quick question that's similar in, in nature to the first question, right? So let's say, hypothetically, uh, that I've completely bumbled my list, and uh, is it ca are you capable, is there a way to repair the damage done in the sense that, like, you know, your, your emails are showing up in the promotion tab, for example? Uh, you, you've already established this horrible reputation with the service provider. What can I do to repair that, sort of starting from scratch? One of the things that I recommend, and it's just a little bit of a technological trick, is to change the email address that the newsletter is coming from. That is not foolproof by any means, because obviously all of the providers have many ways of looking at who's sending what. But one of the things that will happen is that if your specific email address is a little bit iffy, but your domain as a whole has not proven to be iffy, starting to send it from something else might help. So if you used to send it from your name at your domain, maybe send it from I wouldn't recommend newsletter because that kind of signals, <laughs> like nobody wants this because it's a newsletter. Um, the newsletter ninja email comes from, I think it's obviously at newsletterninja.net. 
is what it is. So like pick something and then um, change that email address is a great way to do it. You are, however, if you let it lie fallow like that, and a lot of people have kind of gone by the wayside, that you're just not gonna be able to get them back. And that's why you wanna do it right from the beginning, which is not to flog you for having blown it, because it's okay. Um, but going forward, be sure that you're really being really robust about making sure that people are opening and people are clicking and that you're pruning the people who aren't active so that you don't have that happen. Because it is hard to get out of promotions and almost impossible to get out of spam. So you wanna, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, we're running out of time. Oh. I think I can only do one more. But you guys, come and see me after. I'll answer whatever. Uh, you had a great list of questions to get data on, on your readers, but that's like 30 questions or something. <laughs> how, uh, how, how, how do you manage to get them to, to respond to that? Do you put it all in the first, in introductory email? How do you no. do that? Do not answer. Do not ask them all of the questions. In fact, try not to ask them more than one, although two can work because they might not care about one. Um, Getting to know them in this way is really an ongoing process. So you, if, if you've got one onboarding email, you're gonna probably wanna bump it up a little bit. Um, but you don't have to have 10. What I say in class is nobody's interesting enough for more than five, which is super rude, <laughs> especially when people are like, oh, I have 10. Um, but as a general rule, keep it as slow as you can and then just trickle those questions out and decide which ones are most important to you. Save the rest for ongoing newsletter activity so that you've always got something to talk to them about. Okay, so you wouldn't suggest using the no, Google do, survey or whatever? Don't bombard them. Um, and okay. in general, if you're gonna do any kind of survey or poll, you're gonna have to be able to fit all the questions on one page because people aren't gonna answer like 20 questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. That's it. All right, but you guys should come see me. Thanks, guys. <laughs>